So I think that uh, as a place to get started, it would be awesome if we could just do really quick introductions. I'll go super fast because I'm by far the least important person. Uh, my name is Alex Johnson. I am the creator of the FinTech Takes newsletter uh, and write about the FinTech space. Uh, generative AI uh, is a topic that has been a favorite of mine over the last little bit. So um, I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, Maria, could I ask you to um, give a quick introduction for yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Maria Dalbear. I'm a partner at Further Advisory. Uh, we're a boutique strategy consulting firm that works at the intersection of, of uh, technology, strategy, and operations in particular. Uh, we focus in on the financial services and uh, uh, industry in particular, as well as and, and have a deep background in payments. My background is, is deeply in payments across the... Uh, in, both in product roles and as a consultant. Um, and so I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you guys. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Sarah, you're up next. Would you mind giving a quick introduction? Happy to. And Alex's newsletter is one of my favorite parts of every week. So he definitely, <laughs> if you're if you're not on it, you should definitely get on his distribution. Uh, so I'm a partner at Bank Capital Ventures based in San Francisco. I focus on making investments in growth stage fintech companies and also spend some work within application software with companies that have an embedded finance opportunity as well. My background is actually from the operating side. So I spent six years helping scale an enterprise software company called APT that was acquired by MasterCard back in 2015. So my entry to the payments world was through acquisition and trying to understand it from the um, inside out. And uh, it's really been awesome to dive into the generative AI topic in, in this landscape. And so I'm thrilled for the conversation and excited for the topics afterwards with everyone as well. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And um, Sarah, if you haven't read any of the work that she has written on the topic of generative AI, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, her and the team at Bain do a, a tremendous job. Um, very excited to have you on the panel. And then Alec, would you mind uh, rounding out the introduction? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alec. Um, I'm uh, from a company called Modern Treasury. We make software that moves money. So we're an operating system for money movement across different verticals. And uh, I specifically focus on partnership strategy with large financial institutions. So I get a good view and look into some of the kind of workings of large financial institutions and how they think about payments, as well as the intersection of software and AI in this space. Awesome. Great. Well, um, again, we have the exact right group of folks put together to um, have a really awesome discussion. I think for the purposes of getting started, before we dive into the meat of how AI and payments collide, um, I think it would be a good idea to level set for a few minutes on payments, I'm sorry, on AI itself. I know for myself, just speaking personally, that I've had a very difficult time keeping up with everything that's happened in AI. I think uh, Nick and a few of the other folks who were helping organize this, we joked when we first started putting this topic together that our outline and our idea for what we could talk about might be completely different by the time we actually got to the event, because that's how fast AI and everything in this space is evolving. So I want to try to be as precise as we can in our discussion. And I'm wondering maybe if we can start with just a really quick definition of what generative AI is. Uh, Sarah, I think you're probably our resident expert here. Would you mind giving an introduction? I'm happy to. And you're not alone. I think one thing that makes this space so exciting is that it changes so rapidly. And so it does require us all to be students in a really exciting way during this time. So in terms of AI itself, that's it, artificial intelligence is nothing new, especially in fintech and finance more generally. So we've been using predictive analytics as a really critical role in delivering products and delivering services associated with those. What is new about generative AI is that rather than using past data to predict future data, generative AI is more human-like in that it allows us to create new information. And so that generation could be images, it could be text, it could be sounds, right? So there's there's a limitless um, opportunity for new generation. And what enables that is the underlying models themselves, so the, transfor the transformer models and the large language models. And so these models have ingested the corpus of internet data 
And we'll get into in this discussion, I'm sure, about why that's a good thing and a bad thing as it applies to different applications, specifically within fintech. But that a huge corpus enables the model, therefore, to look at on-scene prompts and actually generate new answers to those prompts. And that intelligence is unlike anything we've seen before with different types of predictive analytics. And so the way that we've thought about it through dozens of conversations with different companies is that this AI is very, uh, it's supplemental to the predictive AI that's been so core to fintech for a long time. And so it's not this case where it's out with the old and in with the new, but rather we're seeing generative AI really coexist with predictive AI to make better decisions, to make processes better, to make costs lower for companies. And I'm sure we'll get into plenty of examples of that. Awesome. No, I, I think that's a really, really great definition. Thank you for that uh, to kind of level set us. I guess the next thing I'm curious about is, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be super specific to, to fintech or payments, but I, a conversation I hear a lot in this space is, well, what would you use this for? Right? Because kind of, Sarah, as you pointed out, um, the, the technology is just fundamentally different than the way that traditional machine learning has worked in uh, financial services and elsewhere. It's not necessarily better or worse. There are pros and cons, but it's just very, very different. So wondering, um, and this can be to whomever on the panel has sort of a good example, like what is a good example of where this can be used in like a good application for generative AI? Where does it really sing? We have a very polite panel who doesn't want to interrupt each other. Sarah, why don't you go first? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm happy to kick it off. I, I would maybe to take the part of the question about, about where it doesn't apply. I think after there was the, it, the consumer explosion of interest, right, from ChatGPT and everyone got their hands dirty in it and got really excited, I think there was this desire to see where it could apply everywhere. And so people went in, tried it. They tried to make recipes, create you know, wedding invitations, like all, all kinds of things that people are trying to do, write speeches. Um, and that was kind of like a once and done. It, it was a novel idea. And then this question of, okay, well, how does it actually apply to real enterprise applications that have a much higher degree of quality that's required? Um, and so we definitely went through this hype period. And some may argue that we're still there. I think we're going to talk <laughs> about that later too, which I'm excited about, about where we are in the hype cycle. But we went through this period where people were trying to apply generative AI to everything. And I think the key piece to really think about where it should and should not be applied is that it's about solving a problem better. And so any technology that you're throwing at a problem should help in the solution. It shouldn't just be a novel application that's a fun thing to do because it, all it does is just add cost. And the cost associated with running these models is not insignificant. And so I think what we saw in the beginning was a lot of these novel ideas about trying to throw generative AI in for the purpose of using it, kind of like sprinkles on a cupcake, but rather what you needed to do is figure out where it was core to actually the solution set. And so examples of that to answer the first part of your question, I think are really in services heavy components of, uh, of financial services, but across industries. And so those are the pieces often of the puzzle of service delivery, where it's still required humans to be heavily involved because it's very iterative and you can't just rely on past data to predict future results. And that has been a really large part of the cost of the gross margin tech um, stack that is associated with service delivery as well. And so we're actually seeing that generative AI does not replace the human in the loop, but it helps us move faster and more toward a more productized solution. Um, and there's a lot of uh, innovation that we're seeing that companies are, are able to unlock in those areas. So the, the service delivery piece is one area we're particularly excited about. Interesting. Now, that's really helpful. And I, I think, Alec, maybe I can go to you next on this, but like, I know you guys are actively experimenting with this tech right now. You obviously work with a lot of large banks and other financial institutions who I'm sure are sort of kicking the tires on as well. What do you, what do you think in terms of like where it applies and, and how to think about applying this technology? Yeah, no, I think Sarah laid out a really good framework where uh, it's, first of all, it's an iteration like that we went from just your classical programming to I would call kind of your classical AI or machine learning as we used to call it. And now it's like generative AI. Um, and kind of where, where I do see the market is going right now is there's a lot of consumer uh, facing applications that are getting a lot of tractions um, in the generative AI space. I think we're also, we're seeing kind of 
um, traction picking up in places like healthcare, for example, where you have a lot of unstructured data, and then you can just, uh, you know, make really, really good kind of predictions, recommendations, and um, and and content even related to like the uh, the data that's that's coming from like healthcare space within payment space. Um, it, I think it's an interesting discussion, and that's why I was so intri intrigued about uh, this conversation. Is because payments are very tricky, they're very regulated, and they're very well structured. Like if you think about how payments in the U.S. work, they work either on a credit card rail, or they work on an ACH rail, or on like on RTP rail or uh, Fedwire rail, and those rails are very well defined. And so it's not necessarily an unstructured data problem, like for example, I don't know, in, in like healthcare and like computer vision. So where we do see uh, generative AI kind of coming in, uh, in as a little bit interesting uh, angle, I would say in developing applications, being that co-pilot in developing applications, in generating simulations to test your applications or to test your different products, uh, where today, um, you know, engineers spend a ton of time creating test environments and test cases to uh, to make sure that the applications actually work really well in a payment space. Um, and there are other, I would say, areas for me specifically, I'm really excited, I'm just as excited about, I would say, the operational space as I am about some of this like blue sky thinking and is things like reconciliation, for example. Um, so, for example, at Modern Treasury, um, we built this highly performant reconciliation engine that ingests like millions of transactions and matches them to bank statements so that humans don't have to. But there is always like a very small percentage of use cases where that like classical programming cannot address. And so this is where we are looking at AI to help kind of close that gap. And I think other companies are looking at similar kind of capabilities. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, go ahead, jump on it. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing is there's the actual payment stream, right? And then there's the whole operational responsibilities of operating a payments or banking function in an or in a in a bank or or financial institution, and the need to interact with efficiently and effectively with customers and address their problems. So I would definitely second the opportunity to take, you know, the question of, you know, the use cases when we're talking to our clients who are, are working in this space, they're looking at some of the points you were talking about, the content and code generation. How do you do that well? Um, how do you summarize data and create intelligence with that data? Perhaps in this scenario where you have a frontline employee who's trying to create a more intelligent conversation uh, with with those that are they're seeking to help, whether it's the frontline customer support or eventually an advisor. Though the more what I would say is a challenge is in these highly regulated industries, there has to be uh, you know there's a there's a lot of um, concern around anything that affects the. In direct engagement of an end customer and making sure that that is um, fair and explainable. So that's where we're seeing a real tendency to be careful there. Um, and then really in terms of internal knowledge management. So um, being able to help an organization manage and extract insights that they could then put together. A great example is of a, a, a an organization that we, we were looking at a case study was around um, you know, reports back to uh, treasury uh, tr uh, trust reports. Now that's not payments, but it's the idea of being able to pull together a massive amount of information that's incredibly repetitive and difficult to comb through, but you need to do it with a high degree of consistency and, and integrity. And yet it's also got a buffer uh, before you're going to the end customer. Um, I think that would be an important theme that I would say is like in these highly regulated environments, they are not, uh, you know, when we've been talking to clients, they are not yet ready to unleash, you know, the direct interaction with, um, with, with, uh, you know, a generative AI experience um, because of it's of its lack of explainability and, and traceability and, and just concern that it could be hacked and misused. So that's what I'm Absolutely. Seeing. Yeah. No, I actually put a finer. 
Yeah. No, please Sorry. go ahead, Sarah. Sorry, yeah. Alex. No, 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 I know we're just getting started, but I'm going to put a finer point, um, just bringing together what Alec and Maria were talking about. I think on this operation side, so what's away from like the core product strategy that you're talking about where regulatory is really critical as Maria was talking about, but on the operation side, like code generation, internal knowledge management, marketing, I would actually say it's not just can companies find value, but rather we're seeing that if you don't find value there, you're going to be behind your, yeah. your competition. So your cost is going to be higher. Like your cost structure is going to be different than your competitors. And so you will not be able to be as competitive in the market. And so it's really, there's an imperative today to figure it out. It's not just a nice to have. Yeah. Yeah. To give an example of that, one of the, I was in a, a sort of internal dialogue with some folks across the different large financial institutions, one of which um, described that they were expecting to pull out by the end of FY24, uh, uh, 80 to 100 million in uh and in, in operating costs um, that they were literally goaling, like they were getting commitments to literally reduce budgets or increase throughput. So one of the guidances that they were saying to put a point to, to Sarah is that they were not making this sort of pie in the sky. They were saying, you want money, you want to do this, you want to take this to the next level. What are you going to take out or what are you, what operational metric are you going to improve in order to justify it. So I think there's a bit of some learning about some of the more wishful thinking of some of the other uh, technology experiences recently where, you know, um, I would say, you know, blockchain everywhere was kind of a little bit like, they honestly feel a little burned, right? Some of the, some of the use cases will absolutely eventually make sense and they do, but, you know, there, there's, I feel like there's this deliberate um, structured approach that is being taken in this around, as you said, return on effort um, investment because it isn't. It's non-trivial, you know, the to to get these models to work well and to rethink the operational processes and do the training needed um, to make it successful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think to to sort of put a bow on this part of the conversation before we dive more into payments. I mean, what I'm hearing you guys say is that um, this is a really robust model but it's not necessarily one that's purpose built for every single potential use case. And so you are definitely seeing it more in the back office as opposed to being customer facing, more focused on reducing operational expenses. I think as Alec indicated, like it's great at edge cases, things that fall outside of rules and predictive models where normally you have to have human judgment sort of at that moment, it can potentially fit in there. So let's sort of transition the discussion to more focus on payments, which is obviously our kind of core topic today. Um, just broadly speaking, when you think about how this applies to payments, I think you've already touched on it a little bit, but where are some of the sort of high level areas that jump out to you as a big opportunity? And Alec, maybe we can go back to you because I know you already kind of started to, to answer this question. Yeah, I mean, so maybe I'll kind of start from the top. I think there's a lot that can be done from like an acceptance standpoint, where um, I think today the models that are being used by, you know, credit card companies as well as banks um, in order to improve throughput are pretty good, but there's still some fallout. So I think generative AI and, gener and actually just probably just regular AI can be very helpful in making sure that, you know, if a, if a, if a, if a customer wants to buy something, they actually are able to do so uh, uh, easily. Um, there are also um, opportunities, that I would say, like on the uh, development side, as I mentioned, um, there's plenty to be done there. Um, but one area that I was super impressed with um, like if you wanted to start a payments company today, it would take a lot. Like you would need to have like an ar army of engineers. You would have to have people, like people on this panel who really know a lot about payments. But I think with things like generative AI, you could train it on a corpus of data to really understand how payment systems in the US work by having it ingest like that data and, and create at least the front end, not necessarily the back end, but the front end to actually operate at a pretty decent level. I'll give a little anecdote. I was playing with ChatGPT4 the other day and um, there's a new feature there and it's called uh, image to code. So you can literally snap an image of a website or of something and say, hey, write me an HTML code that represents this thing. And that was just never 
a thing to be done before. And so what I'm imagining right now is that before, if you wanted to start a, uh, like a company in the payment space, you don't like you would need a bunch of engineers. Now you probably just need one or two people to get started and um, and you can get going. Yeah, if you're um, to, to that point, if you're not paying the 20 bucks a month to play with version four of ChatGPT, you absolutely should because it really is. I've been playing with it for the last couple of months and it's like a window into the future in terms of like what's possible. And I think that's a that's a really great example. Um, Maria, maybe you could go next in terms of just giving me sort of your high level view on when you look at that payments value chain, where do you see generative AI most sort of naturally fitting in? Yeah, I mean, I would say... Um... Again, in the current environment, I feel like there is a lot of constraints, even in the question of acceptance, because it'll be like the question of criteria and trace traceability and fairness that at least traditional, you know, larger players are not yet ready to go there. Um, but I think as they as we look at ways to um establish, you know, the what we're hearing is the need to kind of go through the process along with um with the regulators who are thinking about the different scenarios of, of being operating at these key decision points. So I would say that the focus right now in the, in the next, you know, six to nine to 12 months, maybe 18, I don't know, it may, it may we will shift right to your point about how fast it is. Um, they are very, it, I, we're seeing more of the use cases around making these operational processes, whether they're um, work, work better, um, I I definitely around uh, reconciliation of payments in the B two B space. I that is, you know, a, an incredibly messy space process right now, and the ability to kind of help organizations organize their data sets and and op and manage some of the throughput um, to in order to be able to create more of a straight through processing model. Um, that is something that I, I I imagine is coming fast and furious, and I, obviously modern treasury is on it, but. I think that's going to be a necessity uh, because the expectations of that are being set through both real time. If you're going to, you need to build the intelligence to complete uh, that reconciliation and 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 management of finance. So I think over time there's opportunities to infuse the payments process with greater intelligence because you can use it better. Whether it's in the case of B two B and and helping to manage your um, manage your exposure risk or forecast what you need in terms of cash flow. And then on the personal side, the personal financial side, management side, I mean, right now, we're still very rudimentary. All of the existing systems that are doing that are very much still reporting back for the most part, what your budget, you know, what you spent yesterday and in and the past three months. And that's, I don't, I see that moving. I see people being wanting to interact uh, with their, with those financial institutions that see those transactions and help them manage their their lives better. Um, but I think, again, we're going to walk, crawl, run, at least in the large players uh, before we get there. I think they're going to do some of the safe use cases uh, first. Yeah, no, I think uh, to your point, I mean, one of the, the themes that sort of keeps coming up whenever we talk about generative AI is, you know, where, where is it going to fit? Where is it going to make the most sense? Like one really easy place to look is like, where are human beings doing work that just sucks to do? And like reconciliation is a really good example of this, right? Where it's just like, oh my God, like this is just a nightmare to work on, whether it's the end company that's doing it, or it's like a B2B platform that's helping with it. Like there are just these areas where despite all the advancements in decision rules and automation and predictive modeling and sort of traditional ML, there are still these areas where we know we have to have human beings plugged in, but we also know there's just so little value and a great deal of like, I mean, this is a little dramatic, but like pain on the part of human beings involved in these processes. So I think to your point, that's a really interesting way to kind of hone in on those areas. The other thing you mentioned that I just want to put a fine point on, and Sarah, I'd like to come to you on this question as well, is the idea of being able to embed intelligence, right? Because one of the things that I was talking to a founder who's working on generative AI product in the accounting space, actually. And one of the things that he was saying was that, you know, if you think about the way that these workflows and processes work today, even if you're using automation, whether it's if then rules or predictive models, or whatever the thing is, none of those by themselves are intelligent, right? Like they're like these kind of like components that are just machines that do a thing, you give it a thing, and it outputs a thing, and then it moves on. Yes. And all of the intelligence, right, is 
the human being who's assembling all of those little widgets into a workflow that makes sense, streamlines the process. And then, of course, that human being has to be standing next to that process and making sure like it's working. There's no weird edge cases. So we're not really outsourcing today a lot of intelligence yeah. in the way that we do these things, even though we have gotten more efficient thanks to technology and decision rules and automation and predictive models. And the difference with generative AI is it's one of those components that you can drop into a workflow like anything else, but it's intelligent and it has the ability to do some reasoning and some problem solving. So I think that sort of mental model shift of how would you design the ideal workflow when you can drop intelligence in is, is pretty interesting. I don't know, Maria, if you have a comment on that before we keep going. Yeah, one quick thing is I think that you can have almost two different envision a future with two different types of experience. Um, one is where it's the workflow, right? It's the applications that are creating that intelligence and they're creating insights that, and then mm -hmm. because it can be conversational to, to the point about how the form factor can show up or can generate images, um, it can be a little bit interactive in sort of the way that, you know, when we have watched like Star Trek or something and it says, computer, can you tell mm -hmm. me what my best uh, decision around uh, when I should, uh, you know, create some, I, I might need some lending because I'm increasing my expenditures over the next 12 months because I'm going to hire some new staffs. Can you tell me what I would want to do in terms of optimizing between my money management account, my line of credit, or should I open be establishing a new thing? We're not there yet, but like that doesn't seem ridiculous, right? Because we're we're at a point now where there is so much information that's available. But right now, to your point, we're we still have a model where we're doing one thing at a time. Like we're still extracting things to see a spreadsheet of what our information is as a small business We're, you know, we're working in this way. And then we're thinking, gee, what do we need to do about that? You know, as opposed to, can you help me tune my, my business life or my finance, my own personal life? I manage many roles and I know many of you do. Like if I could have something that would basically just tell me when I need to do something for managing my elderly parents, like stuff. And I wouldn't have to like log in and make sure nothing bad happened. Like, and that would be, that would be life altering. And I think we're going to get there, but there is um, inherently a question of trust. And I think this is where uh, the magic and the machine were, you know, and the question of values of the financial institutions and making those explicit and how they show up in the decisioning models. Like that is going to be a level of, thinking that I don't think has ever had to be done. Because one of the beauties of having each of these little things optimized for that operational efficiency of that function as a, as a financial piece, like a risk piece or what, is that there's no like through line of whose interests are we making these decisions in any way. Whereas I think generative AI actually potentially opens up a little bit of a, you know, a, a new way of thinking, which is how, who's, who, who are we optimizing for? And I don't think the banks, have, I mean, as far as I know, I don't think anyone's quite gotten there. But I, I think this whole question of values and trust is going to become like an absolute cornerstone issue. And it's going to, in my, if I were to predict the future, I think it's going to define who's the ultimate winners and the ultimate losers. But there's also a lot of missteps that could happen and, and honestly damage the reputation of the industry in which we operate as a whole. If people yeah. are- Minor. Alex, can I pick up on that last yeah. point just really quickly? I think it's um Do. so my my partner Matt actually wrote a, a piece on this about how there's been a lot of concern by large financial institutions for good reasons, as Maria was talking about, around how generative AI could give the wrong information or misinformation. But his point that I I loved um is that it's actually what's more scary or should be more scary is generative AI telling the truth. So generative AI telling a Wells Fargo mortgage customer that actually they can get a much better rate by going over to First Republic, right? Like that's a scary thought. <laughs> if you have intelligence that's helping you at, at your fingertips actually optimize for what the consumer wants. Um, so that's, it's a good piece to check out if you haven't already. Um, and then Alex, I'm happy to go wherever you wanted. I had some, a few other thoughts to jump on. I'd love I, for you to jump in. I was going to go to you yeah, next, so keep perfect. going. Yeah. I mean, um, so I thought it would be helpful maybe to give two examples from the consumer side and then also from the B2B side on, in the payment space. So of real applications that we're seeing today. And also, I think it speaks to your embedded intelligence comment as well. And, and so we are seeing 
really innovative startups actually doing that. So on the consumer side, one place where we've seen it in the payments application is a company that actually I think today or yesterday actually announced their latest funding round, um, Darwinium. And so what they're doing is they're they're attacking the problem of fraud. And so as you can imagine, given how creative generative AI is, the uh, the deep fakes and all of the different emails and and fraud fraud that can be created by the bad guys can be that much more sophisticated than it was before. And so what this company is doing is actually leveraging those same models, so leveraging generative AI to create a plethora of bad, uh, like fraud, fraud synthetic, like synthetic fraud, and then mm-hmm. using that to further train their own models. And so it's this basic back and forth of creating a stronger and stronger fraud machine that because it uses generative AI, and not just predictive AI, it's able to anticipate what will happen next in the market rather than just rely on what's already been seen. And so there's always this cat and mouse game associated with fraud, but that's one way to actually think about getting in front of it. And so it's a great team. Um, and so it, it'll be exciting to see what they continue to do. Um, an, an example on the B2B side is a company called Slope Pay. And so what they're doing is they have, they've built an internal LLM model, Slope GPT, and a core piece as it applies to payments is actually thinking about um, for the B2B PNPL space, how much can they allow, like, like how much are they actually lending or making available to these different small businesses? And to answer that question is often, it's very iterative, right? Every small business looks different. Sometimes you have co-mingled finances between the business owners and the actual business itself. You can have really stochastic revenue streams. Your cost can be all off. Like there's a lot of complication that happens. And so everyone doesn't look the same. And so what they're actually doing is in, ingesting all of the financial data and as well as all of the publicly available data around a business and using that within the slope um, slope GPT model to actually help them understand what they should allow for, for the B2B PNBL offering. Um, and so those are two like in the in actual production examples that we're seeing that I think are great. Um, and then just to 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 talk as well about how there are opportunities on the revenue side. I think David had a great question that he put in the chat around that. So if you think about fraud, so there is so there's so many payments that are declined because of the risk that they're actually not a payment that's supposed to go through. But if you can become more precise around that, so around the false negatives, you actually overall increase your revenue. And that's a, a large consideration for a lot of consumer um, retail companies, right, that are trying to get online commerce and have large fraud rates and so have to be really careful and conservative. And so the opportunity to become much more precise using generative AI actually unlocks revenue at the top line for a lot of these companies. And that's where we're seeing these enabling fintech companies play such a tremendous role. Um, and then maybe just one last thought too, <laughs> and then I'll turn it back to, to go around. Um, the, the last thought I had was this this question of the payment reconciliation, I think, is also very relevant for consumers too. Um, so, how 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 often have we found on our on our credit card statements a, a merchant that we've never heard of? Right, it's a merchant right. ID that doesn't make sense, and so there's no smart reconciliation that's happening today. Or um, for happy reasons, I am in a bunch of medical bills, and so trying to make my way through claims, it's like, how do I make sense of what's valid and not? And the percentage of claims that are wrong is atrocious, and so you should look at all of it. I actually fed that all into the beta version of a startup's model who's working in the healthcare claim space and helped me um hold all the AI. And so we're just Oh, apologies. Uh, I might have had an internet issue on my side. That's um, that's really, really helpful, Sarah. I, I, I think those examples are really, really great. The other area I wanted to ask about, um, we kind of have touched a little bit on B2C. We've touched on B2B. I think the other main sort of category, if you will, within payments is this sort of um, operational back office area, which we've talked about in a general sense, but I'm kind of curious for 
folks's opinions on like what are all of the from a payments lens specifically what are all of the sort of operational back-end areas that are maybe kind of common across different types of payment companies where we think generative ai may be able to kind of plug into i think alec maybe you um, were the first one to kind of mention that um that might be an area where you guys are already experimenting with it or where you see some potential values maybe you could start there yeah, maybe I'll start with, um, you know, just several years ago, I was working for a large consulting company and automation was a big thing. I mean, Sarah was talking about, and then, you know, like Maria was talking about it as well. Like all these large, let's call them Fortune uh, 500 companies are under a lot of pressure to either cut costs or improve customer or employee experiences, you know, when it when it when it comes to like doing stuff that people just don't want to do. Like, let's be honest, nobody wants to do reconciliations. Um, and so what I've seen there is that, you know, college just a couple of years ago to make to do intelligent automation within a large company is really, really hard. And it just like didn't work really well. Like I've seen plenty of projects that failed where, you know, they try to automate and it kind of worked. But it was it was not quite there. It was not precise or good enough where it had plenty of value. I think with what I'm really excited with, like this new wave of generative AI, what happened was, or what's happening is that it's kind of lifting all the boats of technology to a new level. Like because Chat GPT became so popular, all of a sudden everybody's in AI, and all of a sudden your cost of compute is going like as close to zero as possible, right? And so, and like, if you think about access to some of these large models or access to some of these capabilities, just a couple of years ago, that only a handful of companies had access to these capabilities. Why? Because they were so, so expensive. Like there's only certain companies who could afford, you know, hundreds and hundreds of like Grace Hoppers, you know, H100s, whatever from NVIDIA. Now, like that thing is becoming democratized and a lot of people can have access to that. What that means is that there's a lot of more intelligent automation that we will probably start seeing happening uh, in the corporate space. Uh, within modern treasury, we're we're starting to uh, do some of that as well, kind of like addressing some of the use cases in our edge cases that I said, particularly in reconciliation. And I'm, I'll go back to reconciliation. I'm going to hammer on it because... Nobody should, no company should do reconciliation by hand. It's it's a horrible experience. Like, but just to provide a little bit of context, just for folks on, you know, who probably not as familiar, every company that moves money needs to reconcile transactions to their bank statements, to their GL, period. Like you can't close the books until that is done. You can't just say, good enough, take a swag, let's go. That's just not going to happen. And so you have to reconcile. And the way that it's done today is literally, it's like humans time at times Excel spreadsheets. And so like in today's world, that it just should not exist. So we're trying to kill manual reconciliation. And so that's exactly where we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of traction. The other area that we are seeing is specifically in payments and B2B payment space um, used for not necessarily generative AI, but your uh regular classic AI and machine learning is um, parsing through payments data, understanding that context and uh, infusing it with additional payment details that helps us, our customers do better analytics or like better predictability of payments or just like make sure that payments don't fail. So if you think about how different financial institutions work, they all have different quirks in the way that they kind of require uh, their customers to structure their payment files. Sounds very boring, but that, that's just the operational reality. The way that B of A requires a customer to structure their payment files is different from like JP Morgan, from Wells Fargo, from, you know, you, you call it whatever bank. And so those quirks, a lot of times, you know, you can address them through your regular programming applications, but there's edge cases where it's just easier, maybe to Sarah's point, to have to come in with AI as a scalpel and say, okay, like th this is the right tool for this obscure job where we need to enhance um, a parse and enhance this data in order to kind of solve this very, very real problem where otherwise we'll have to put engineers on it. 
Yeah, that ability to think of AI as a, a scalpel that you can just apply to these very narrow problems. I think that's a that's an awesome analogy. Um, the other area I wanted to circle back on real quick, and then I promise we will leave some time for questions. So I've seen a couple come in. We will get to those, and please keep submitting questions through the chat. Is I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the sort of consumer perspective on all of this. Um, you know, I mean. I think, Maria, maybe I'll go to you first on this because you were sort of talking about trust as being a cornerstone of all of this. All of this has evolved so fast. And I feel like uh, a lot of people, obviously, as Sarah mentioned, have been experimenting with this stuff thanks to ChatGPT. But I think a lot of regular consumers and even employees at businesses, they sort of had that initial flash in the pan. Oh, my God, this is really cool. And then at least a lot of people I know anecdotally I've kind of moved on or forgotten about it to a degree. Not me, I'm obsessed with it, but like most people are kind of moving on to a degree. And I think the next area where they're going to see or feel this impact from generative AI, it'll be behind the scenes, right? It'll be applications that they're working with where this technology is being used, but they don't necessarily know that. And I think that's a really important thing to think about as an industry because, you know, the next brush your customers are going to have with this technology is going to be through you. And the impact of that and the way you put safeguards around that, the way that you help them think about what you're doing with them, all of those things matter a tremendous amount. So, I mean, Maria, maybe you could start. What's sort of your 30,000 foot take on distrust and sort of the consumer lens on this whole question? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about I had a moment a couple of, I guess about a month ago, I think when we were getting ready for this, where I walked into, um, this wasn't in the payment space, but it, I was thinking about why this was, nobody was reacting. I went into a, for a routine scan, a health scan, um, and literally conference level poster, right as you're walking into the routine like scan for um, radiological scan was... Um, basically like a whole thing about how they leverage AI in, in the, um, in the, you know, imaging process in these medical scans. And I thought, wow, like they're not hiding from it. They're like, you know, proudly sort of showing that this is an additional layer of, of the way they're positioning it as quality of, of a check and I was thinking, like, why is this nobody sort of reacting? Because the assumption is that it is not instead of. It is not like the radiologist has been like, I'm so glad I'm going to be, you know, drinking my coffee. And this this AI tool is going to, like, figure out whether I have anything in this scan that I, you need to be worried about. Um, it. it they were seeing consumers and and because literally no one was reacting except for me. I just I took a picture of it and like people and they probably thought it was weird. But I was like, why is no one even like registering this? Because to them, it's all like it's almost like in you know AI inside. It's Intel inside. It's like you know you you have an extra layer of intelligence that is in there for you to help create trust and and quality and assurances. And so I think that as we think about an area, like there's few things in one life that's more important than one's health. And ne next um, up is probably one's financial life. Um, and, you know, in terms of their ability to manage their own life and those the obligations that they have. And so I, I imagine that we will start to see it in a similar way, but it will have this extra hurdle because we are going to need to make sure within the financial services and in payments industry that it is a it is a badge of quality. It is a badge of reassurance and 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 integrity. So, for example, around reconciliation, it's a great example because, like, if it does it better and you're able to quickly go, yep, that's that is that is value delivered. Whereas, I think the question of when it's making decisions in ways that you know to your to the point that you're not sure whether you trust the decisions being made, those are those are harder. And then. So I think it will be through this layer where that you know I, I'm not I'm not just interpreting my own scans instead of the radiologist. There's an expert who's been trained for many years, who is using it as a tool, and I I think that's what's going to happen in financial services as well, and in, in in particular to start. Absolutely, um, Sarah. I'm going to just go out on a limb based on our conversation to date and guess that you have some thoughts here. So why don't you why don't you jump in on this? Uh, sort of consumer trust sort of angle as well. 
Yeah, happy to. I'm trying to go on and off mute to help too. I know it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to do everything remotely. Um, and an another element I was just going to mention is that I think financial services has burned consumers before. And so how often have you been, you called a call center to try to resolve an issue and they're trying to take you through a touch tone customer service that's like AI enabled, but you say, yeah, instead of yes. And it doesn't know that yeah is yes. And then it can't actually route you to the right place. Like, yeah, like AI show hands. enabled, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, or a robo advisors, right? So there is this promise of, of customized, specialized wealth management, and it was going to democratize access to wealth management through, you know, AI, but it actually didn't do it. And so it like people have kind of been burnt before. And so I think there is it, it, to even add to what Maria is saying, there's this hurdle that we have to get over to help people feel that they can that they can trust. Um, maybe to bring this into like, so what does this mean for people building in this space? So I I think there is it. It's one thing to have the opportunity to experiment, but it's very different to actually work with the generative AI to get it to recognize what it does and doesn't know. And there are a lot of experiments that have been run on generative AI that it likes to be right. And so if you ask for the confidence interval of an answer, it'll always overestimate the confidence interval because it wants to please the person who's actually prompting the generative AI. And so what that requires is actual, actually a ton of sophistication around how you're interacting with and the product that you're wrapping around the generative AI. And so this just goes to everything you're saying around not having it be just exposed to the consumer, but actually wrapped in the product of the, of the organization. And I think this is actually why, as well, there's this really interesting dance this, that, that's emerging between smaller fintechs who are enablers who can help larger financial, in financial institutions leverage under AI and the larger financial institutions themselves. Because oftentimes that tightly bound product and AI, generative AI relationship is really hard to do when you're uh, when you're flying a 747, but is much easier to do when you have a much smaller aircraft. And so it's a place where we're seeing the smaller fintechs and enablers actually emerge as being able to support and and enable generative AI. Well, that actually is a really good segue to the last question I wanted to ask the three of you. So I'm going to ask each of you to answer this question, and then we'll um, we leave a couple minutes for Q&A because I see a couple questions in here that we haven't answered yet. So last question is, and Sarah, this is one that you prompted for me originally because it was something that you guys wrote over in some of the writing that you did at Bain. Is generative AI, and we'll sort of confine this to payments since that's our discussion, is it a disruptive innovation that's going to lead to sort of the disruption of existing market incumbents in the payment space and sort of bring new companies to the fore? Or would you say it's more of a sustaining innovation that's going to sort of assist those incumbents in sort of modernizing that 747 that they're flying? So um, Sarah, maybe you can go first and then we'll do Alec and then end with Maria on this one. Yeah, happy to. So we argue that in the initial brush of what we're seeing in the landscape of how this is developing, and this comes from the perspective of bank capital, of having all of our very large institutions that we support as portfolio companies, in addition to the fintechs as well within the, the BCV portfolio. So what we've seen is that the incumbents are often much better positioned to, to take advantage of it. And so unlike other platform shifts that people have compared generative AI to, where there was this natural um, innovators dilemma, right? Where the large incumbents were unable to actually leverage the, the move to cloud or leverage the move to the internet or the move to, no, to mobile because they would have to disrupt what their current structure was, their current product or service delivery. With generative AI, you can actually just embed it. And in fact, the incumbents have much more uh, data. They have access to the proprietary data. It's often better structured. They have more resources. They're able to pay. All these things put them in a much better position to be the first mover, so to speak, in leveraging generative AI. And we're seeing that play out in many cases. However, this doesn't mean that there isn't a role, as I got started with in the last question, for the uh, disruptors or like for the smaller companies. And in particular, I think it's really the places where it's too difficult for the large financial service institution to create a new product 
because they're, they have everything already wound in the way that the process flows. And so they're instead looking to adopt an outside technology like you would license software, right? They're looking to adopt that from a smaller company who has created like a ready-made product that you can actually just like um, click in. And so I, I, we, we go into a lot of examples of where we think that's going to be true in our work. Um, but it, it's definitely a place that we're seeing emerging now. Awesome. Um, Alec, I mean, obviously you probably have a slightly more biased answer here, but I'd love to hear your perspective. <laughs> no, I, I actually do agree with Sarah to a large degree. I think it's probably fair to say that we're going to see and we are seeing an explosion of innovation starting to happen, but it's primarily around kind of consumer applications, but just maybe software in general. As I said, it's so much easier to start a company now. It's so much easier to develop a website or develop an application as a generative uh, AI having as a, as a co-pilot. So I think maybe that's the disruptive piece. And even maybe from, from a payment perspective, payments like industry perspective, maybe there's a piece there around front end engineering. Maybe you'll have a little bit more disruption with respect to front end engineering, just because it's again, with a uh, with the co-pilot capabilities, but I think for a large, uh, you know, it, in a large degree, there's there's natural breaks that are in this industry uh, that are there for the right reasons, and those breaks exist because of regulators, because of banks, because of other things. And I would slightly tweak it to say, from sustained, I'll probably we'll probably see more enhance. It's like it's already pretty good. Like, can we polish it off and get it to like a slightly next level? And I think we'll see probably a lot of that. But one thing that I'll kind of call out here is companies like Modern Treasury and and, and other payment companies um, in the industry. I think what we're starting to kind of coalesce around is really this thought of responsible AI, because like there's so much going on in the space. It's moving so quickly. And like me personally, as a consumer, when I th when I know everything I know, and when I think about what one could create in terms of a payments experience, taking all my social data, my search data, and my payments data, and guess what? Like Google has all of that. <laughs> um, you know, I I think this is where responsibility comes in and ethics comes in, and I'm really really hopeful that these natural breaks that do exist in the payments industry will be helpful in protecting the, the 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 regular consumer, you and I, from irresponsible AI. Absolutely. No, that's a great, that's a great perspective. Um, Maria, why don't you round us out on this question and then we'll we'll see if we can get to at least one of the, the questions that was submitted during the QA. Yeah, I mean I I think I largely I agree in that um there's really going to be a mix of those who um, figure out how to do this work in an efficient way. I think the level of investment to fine tune models and to combine models to specific use cases is not, is again, a reasonable amount of investment required, which favors some of the bigger entities. But to be blunt, some of the times the bigger entities can can struggle with focus and, and driving consistent execution around those. So um, what I do think has shifted in the marketplace that probably also ultimately does favor the larger entities is that, you know, some of these prior models, there wasn't such a uh, cloud uh, computing wasn't as robust. APIs weren't so pervasive. The ability to kind of do open banking and plug things in from what might be specialized models that uh, fintechs could develop that could get plugged into an ecosystem around solving a particular type of problem, but then pointed at the proprietary data of a large institution. Those were things that, you know, five, 10 years ago were like big, hairy problems. Um, and now there are those larger institutions have had to figure out some of how to work and play in a, in a fintech ecosystem. So I think that that actually also favors their ability to, to, to take advantage of that. That said, I, I definitely think that there's opportunities to rethink what is the nature of how we deliver financial services and and, and, you know, those players need to actually really think hard about what could be and not necessarily, they still have a tendency to be product centric. Um, and I mean, I've seen that. And that's a challenge, right? Because if you're still thinking in terms of the traditional lines of this is a CD, and this is a savings product, and this is a banking product, and, and that isn't how we don't have to go to market that way. 
but I don't yet see an environment where banks are yet able to kind of operationalize that new way of working. And I do think other players might be more able to if they don't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's great. So uh, we're almost out of time. I've kind of figured uh, this topic would take us right to the end of the <laughs> hour. Um, and I, I appreciate everyone's engagement in the chat. There will be an opportunity in the networking to um, continue a lot of these discussions. I guess the one question I will frame to the panel and whomever has a perspective on this, please just jump in is, from David, uh, to what extent is increased regulatory scrutiny or fear of increased regulatory scrutiny affecting the adoption of AI-driven solutions? Does this differ by any particular kind of firm? Are there certain types of firms that will have sort of an advantage in this respect? Um, whoever uh, has a perspective on this, please go ahead and jump in. That's a great question. So the, the the fully large organizations um, have two things that they they one of the observations that was made in some of these discussions was that they've never had more come energy come from a CEO C suite level to drive thinking around this, but they want two things to have it be make sense financially a, a true ROI, and they want to avoid the New York Times test and those two things. Um, and they're very aware of the ethical considerations and they can't afford not to be because things that were very pedestrian, whether it was the Wells Fargo thing, uh, you know, that, that could happen, the question of incentives and how you, what fuel you do, they're very aware that of those experiences and they, and they don't want to accelerate any risks through this. So that's why the back office operations and some of those use cases, they're taking a very uh, measured approach towards building out those and experiments and trying to find ways to learn. So from a, there was uniformity in talking to, uh, to clients and prospective clients that this is, we are in very early stages of this exploration and that it needs to be slow in some ways. But the, I think the second part of the question was, I, I do think this means that you'll see smaller institutions be able to go faster as a result of that. Um, however, in this space, I don't think that the it's first mover advantage. And, and so I think what you'll actually find is that smaller institutions will show it's possible and then everyone in a market will be able to adopt. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, and with that, that takes us to the end of the uh, panel. So uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed the discussion.